Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO and board member of the Churchill Club. And tonight we present an evening with Elon Musk in conversation with Michael Malone. Um, Elon and Mike, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. And I would also like to thank Microsoft for hosting this program this evening. Uh, before we get started, let me mention some of our upcoming events. First, on Tuesday, April 21st, it's virtualization, what's next? Six leading experts will talk about trends and the next generation of this hot technology area. And then next, on Thursday, April 23rd, we present a women, a women tech executive roundtable, what's top of mind in 2009, with an all-star cast, including Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook. Uh, from Facebook. And on April 27th, we have a program about executive leadership style and its effect on business performance. The panel will include Bill Campbell, chairman of Intuit, and others. You can look for that on churchillclub.org this week. And on May 7, it's our 2009 CIO agenda, including the CIOs of Home Depot. Baxter, among others, an incredible group, should be an interesting program. Uh, this, too, will post on the website this week. <coughs> And last but not least, it is our uh, most anticipated program of the year, the Top 10 Tech Trends event on Wednesday, May 20. And this year we have Vinod Kosla, Ram Sharam, Steve Jurvetson, and um, Joe Schoendorf will be making their predictions with high audience participation. And so if you haven't yet made your reservation, please uh, be sure to do that. Just a note about the club, for over 23 years, the Churchill Club has been the leading forum for the Bay Area business and technology community, presenting what's new, what's next, what matters most. We are a nonprofit member-supported group, and so if you are not a member and you enjoy tonight's program, uh, we hope that you will consider joining us, and we make it easy for you to do so. Simply just visit churchillclub.org and go through the steps. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Michael Malone. Mike has had a most impressive career, having covered Silicon Valley and high tech for more than 25 years. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, Fortune, The New York Times, Forbes ASAP, and earlier the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, he wrote or co-wrote a dozen books. He hosted three public television interview programs, a series, and most recently he co-produced uh, co a PBS miniseries called The New Heroes about social entrepreneurs. Uh, when I asked Mike for something about him that doesn't appear in his bio, he admitted that he was nearly expelled from Santa Clara University because he, he used a certain obscenity, I believe he said it contained 12 letters, um, in his school paper column. I'm sure that wasn't the, the uh, first time that Mike stirred things up, and I trust that it will not be the last either. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to respected journalist and author, Mike Malone. Uh, good evening, everybody. Looks like we have a pretty full house. I recognize a lot of faces. And I promise not to, or try not to use that 12-letter uh, that word tonight. <laughs> uh, Elon might, but I'll try not to. I hope um, uh, all of you had a chance to take a look at the, uh, the Tesla Roadster sitting out there in the parking lot. It was the one behind the orange cones that looked very different from all the rest of the cars out there. If you didn't get a chance, try to beat Elon out of here tonight and go take a look at it, or at least watch him tear out of the parking lot silently. So allow me to do an introduction, sir. We've known each other a long time. We have. Uh, the Intertrucial Club is 12 letters. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was just thinking, it, it was 20, it's hard to believe it was 28 years ago that Rich Carlgard and Tony Perkins showed me a plan for this. And it was about this, just a few years before I was shown the plan for eBay. And in both yeah. cases, I said, I just don't think it's going to work. It's crazy. No, it's just crazy. <laughs> So let me introduce you. 37-year-old Elon Musk was born and raised in South Africa, but left home at age 17 to make his way in the world. Living on as little as $1 per day, he eventually made his way to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned bachelor's degrees in economics and physics. Musk then attended Stanford's graduate program in high-energy physics, where he lasted exactly two days before dropping out to form a company with his brother. That company, Zip2, was sold for $300 million. Musk then founded X.com, an online financial services company. It eventually became PayPal, of which Elon was the largest uh, shareholder. 
PayPal, as we all know, was purchased by eBay for $1.5 billion in 2002. When he graduated from Wharton, Elon determined the three important areas where he wanted to make a contribution was the internet, clean energy, and space. And with PayPal, Tesla Motors, SpaceX, and Solar City, he has done just that. And in the process, made himself one of the most celebrated entrepreneurs on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, Elon Musk. Thanks. So let's begin with the topic of greatest interest to the audience here okay. tonight, I assume. Uh, Tesla Motors. Okay. Where's the company at right now? Where do orders stand? Oh, Mike, uh, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's been rough. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's actually... It. <laughs> Um, it, it's actually been it's been pretty good. Um, in, in fact, it, it really quite a contrast to the rest of the auto business. Um, we're, we're sold out, first of all, for the Tesla Roadster, so the sports car. We're right. sold out through the end of October, um, and within I, I think probably within uh, two or three months, we'll be actually sold out of all 2009 production for the Roadster. Um, so is this for the standard Roadster or the? Or the advanced version. Well, we are. We do have a Roadster Sport coming out, which is a, a you know for, for those for whom the Roadster is, the Roadster isn't fast enough. Right. Um, there's the Roadster Sport. Yeah. How fast is that one now? Uh, that that'll do zero to sixty in three point seven seconds. So it's, like uh, it's nice, faster than almost any any. It's like car, an ICBM really. laid over on its side. Uh, yeah. It's <laughs> it, it's it's ridiculously fast. Now, how are the orders for that? Uh, good, actually. I, you know, I haven't looked at the latest orders for, for Roadster Sport, and people actually have an opportunity to upgrade their car to the Roadster Sport that are getting their car after, I think, uh, uh, late June or July. And, yeah. and what we're finding is a lot of people are choosing to upgrade their car to the Sport uh, package. Um, so I actually don't have an exact number for you, but it, it, anecdotally, it seems to be doing very well. Now, the Roadster is 109000 is that right? Yeah. And the Actually, Sports 139,000. Do I have yeah, that right? Um, well, the the price to to customers is actually uh, in terms of an, a, a, a comparison price that that's relevant for comparing it to um, a Porsche or something like that is actually about ninety eight thousand dollars. And yeah. and the reason for that is uh, you, uh, if you buy an electric car, you get a seventy five hundred dollar federal tax uh, rebate. E even if you're even if you're an AMT, it, it applies to everyone. Okay. Um, and then uh, you don't pay the gas guzzler uh, tax, which is somewhere in the order of three thousand dollars. Um, so effectively, you know, twelve thousand dollar discount. Yeah, uh, you, you're roughly, t and, and it depends on which which car you compare it against because the gas cost of tax does vary. Uh, but it's somewhere between a, a nine to, to twelve thousand dollar discount, and uh, re relative to a, a gasoline sports car. So in, in effect, you're talking about a car that's just under a hundred thousand dollars as a base price, and then um, the sport package is is another twenty thousand dollars on top of that, um, and that's equivalent to like going from like a, you know, a nine eleven to a nine eleven turbo or something, you know, that that kind of thing. Now, if I were to order one right now, if anybody in the audience want, wants to order one right now, raise your hands. I will take orders. I mean, there you go. <laughs> if somebody out here were to order one right now, what yeah. would it take? What's the deposit and what's the delivery date? Um, so we, we're actually re reducing our, uh, our deposit requirements on the Roadster. I previously, uh, we'd used the, the deposits to provide funding for, for the company. And that was an acknowledged thing. We said, look, we, car companies are very capital intensive, so in order to um, make this... Uh, you know, doable or more doable. We're we're, we're going to take deposits. They'll be at risk. People should recognize that. And then the, the advantage is that they get one of the first cars. Uh, and we actually got a lot of people who who signed up to that. Um, but we don't really need that anymore. Um, so, so we're actually going to reduce the, the the deposit down to uh, I think ninety nine hundred dollars. And then you pay the balance uh, just at, at start of production, which is a couple months prior to delivery. Now, did you find any impact on the orders because with the falling gas prices? I mean, we saw what happened you know, to Prius. I mean, you can go to Sunnyvale right. and entire supermarket parking lots are filled with unsold Priuses. Did that affect you guys at all? I, you know, I don't think that was a, a huge impact um, because most people aren't buying the $100,000 sports car because of, right. you know, to save money on gas. Um, yeah, it's, it's more geek love than it is uh, cheap gas. Yeah, I, I was more worried about what, how that would affect sales for our sedan, um, you know, which we just unveiled a few weeks ago. Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a moment. But yeah. Keep going, yeah. Um, and, uh, but it, it, I, I don't think that's been a, a key impact on, on roads to sales. I think certainly the, the economy as a whole and, and the, um, the implosion of people's net worths has had an effect on, on new roads to sales. And we're fortunate that we do have a significant backlog, you know, going out six months. Um, uh, but um, I wouldn't say gas prices have had a big effect on the road stuff. 
Now, being in the car business, you have to be asked, are you taking any federal money? You know, um... <laughs> and are you worried about your job security if you are? Uh, well, you know, I, I don't have to worry about my compensation. My compensation currently is a dollar, so I'd be happy to cut that in half for the federal government uh, if they do uh, give us a loan. But actually, we've, we've taken no, no government money at all thus far. Um, if some people out there think we, we have, and we haven't. Um, now, we, we do aspire to get a, a government loan for, under the, what's called the ATVM program, it's the Advanced Technology Vehicle Manufacturing Program. That's from the DOE? That's from the DOE. It's not bailout money, and, and, it, and it was, this, was, this program was done before there was uh, a need for bailout money. The, the, this the legislation was written about, I know, about 18, started, started writing it about 18 months ago, and it, got, it finally got approved by Congress um, la last year sometime, I think late, late last year. So, uh, and this is before a vomit. So this isn't stimulus money. This isn't bailout money. This is actually um, something that originated in the Senate uh, Energy uh, Committee because they, they felt it was a matter of national security for, uh, and, and environmental, obviously environmentally important for the United States to, to accelerate its transition away from, from, from oil uh, for all the obvious reasons that uh, the, you know, it's, it's damaging to the, yeah, it's obviously very damaging to the environment. Um, and, uh, as, as gas prices rise, if, you know, cause we, as they will dramatically uh, when we come back to another boom, there's, there's going to be a massive wealth transfer out of the United States right. uh, to, to other countries. And it's just, it's just, it's just kind of silly. You know, for, for that. Why, 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 it's, it's cheaper for us to just accelerate the move of oil. So. Now, I'm not going to ask you how much you plan to get from the government or when, because I think you said that publicly once and got in trouble, didn't you? I did get in trouble. Um, I just said what they told me, and they didn't say keep it quiet. So, um, uh, but uh, I, I suffice to say, we are highly optimistic that we will receive um, approval, loan, loan approval um, in, in the near term. <laughs> okay, well, leave it. let's talk about the factory. That was, uh, there was an awful lot of news a few months ago, groundbreaking ceremonies, yeah. uh, big assembly plant going to be out there on 237 in San Jose. Yeah. Uh, now it seems to be on hold. And something about financing delayed, or you couldn't, you didn't qualify for it, or what happened? Yeah. So the, the San Jose, um, uh, I, the idea of using the, sort of the, the undeveloped land off the 237 in San Jose uh, occurred before the, the Section 136 or the ATVM loan program was approved by Congress. Um, so, um, and one of the clauses in that ATVM loan program is that you have to. Uh, it gives preference to um, manufacturing facilities older than 20 years, which was actually so it's sort of a quasi buy American clause yeah. because the, the 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 foreign car companies that, that have factories here, almost all their factories are younger than 20 years. Um, so it's 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 essentially to bias the cash towards American com companies right. that, that that clause is put in. But nonetheless, it w it's there, which means we can't do greenfield. Um, so. Um, well, I assume there's going to be a lot of empty buildings in Dearborn soon. Is that where you plan on going? Um, no, we'll most likely be in Southern California. We, we actually have term sheets on two locations in Southern California. Um, we, we look first in the Bay Area. Um, I'd love to take over NUMI. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if, if there's – maybe at some point we'll, we'll have an opportunity to acquire NUMI. Um, uh, that would be, that'd be great. Um, I'll take that in a second. Um, but but I, that isn't available right now, and I don't think we – we can't afford it, really, unless they give it to us. Um, which maybe they will. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> now, so, so the, where are the cars being manufactured right now? UK, at Lotus. Uh, actually, the Roadster is uh, it's, it's considered a, a U.S. manufactured car. The final assembly occurs in in the Bay Area in Menlo Park, of all places. Um, that that yeah. well-known auto center. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, bear in mind we're talking low production for the for the Roadster. So right. this is a production rate of uh, around about 25 a week. Um, that might rise to 30 a week uh, in the summer. Um, so, so it's not, it's not I mean, when, you, when you sort of add that up, that's five cars a day. I mean, it's yeah. like your average service center could do a lot more than that. Uh, and and uh, so we, we install the powertrain in, in Menlo Park. We do final vehicle verification. We do the high-speed tests um, out at Moffat Airfield. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and, that's, and then we, we manufacture the, power, the, the battery pack in St. Carlos. Um, so it's... It, by value, talking about something mostly done here. Where do you do the tests at Moffitt? On the, on the airfield. On the runway? Yeah. 
Has any, have any of you ever seen a, a, a Tesla racing down the runway at Moffett Field? <laughs> do you guys like to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning or no, something? No, there's, there's hardly any traffic on Moffett. Uh, nowadays, true. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the new car, sure. the, the S. Tell me about it. All right. Um, th this, is, this, is a, this really is a great car. I mean, the, the Roadster is a good car. I think the S is a great car. Um, and, and I think it's something that will, um, it's really quite historic, or at least it aspires to be, um, in that this will be the first mass-produced highway-capable um, electric car. And that, that's nev there's never been, uh, this may sound strange, but there's actually never been a mass-produced electric car um, outside of golf carts. Um, and, uh, is it the first non-internal combustion mass-produced car since the Stanley Steamer? Yeah, it might be. Wow, okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, there's been hand-built things and conversions of gasoline cars and stuff like that, but, but n not an actual mass-produced mass electric car. Um, so, no, of course, we have to mass-produce it for that to be, be true. Um, uh, so that's why I say it's it aspires to be. Uh, it's, 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 it's aspiration is that. Um, um, and, but if we fulfill that aspiration, then it will be very historic. Um, and uh, uh, this is a car really designed to take full advantage of an electric powertrain. So the packaging is, is very optimized for that. The, the battery pack is in the floor pan between the two axles. So it's this big sort of flat battery pack. It looks a lot like a giant laptop battery pack. Um, in fact, uses laptop cells. I was, was going to say, is it, um, is, is the, is it still a, just a ton of laptop batteries? Well, it's half a ton of laptop half batteries. Half a ton of laptop <laughs> batteries. <laughs> Strapped together. Yeah. Now that's tricky, by the way. So, really, so in advance, strapping in, is tricky. Yeah, uh, I bet. Yeah. So, so you need a lot of micro, you need a lot of processors, right, to, to manage yeah. all that. Yeah. Uh, I think we're like thirty or thirty-two processors or something on board. A lot, a lot of them are like little tiny ones. So you must go to bed every night praying for breakthroughs in battery technology, so you don't have to deal with this. Um, no, you know, it's not too bad actually having a lot, lot, lots of little cells. I mean, we keep. Believe it or not, that, that is the, the highest energy density pack that you can make, is to use a large number of, of laptop cells. And, and we, uh, we keep um, pushing on the cell manufacturers. And technically, by the way, a battery is a collection of cells. And, and the cell, if it's just one, it's a cell. Um, and if it's two, it's a battery. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so the, the cell produ and, and the cell is a chemical engineering problem. The battery, the pack, the battery is uh, is actually a mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software engineering problem. Um, so that there are different types of, you know, ex expertise needed to do to do, to do that. And in fact, th there are there are many makers of cells, but there is only one maker of large lithium-ion battery packs, and that's Tesla. Um, so, uh, and of course, there will, be, there will be others in the future, and th that's why Daimler came to us uh, to make the the battery pack for the new electric smart. Right. Now, you know, I'm, something I've never asked you. My laptop just about sets my pants on fire. How do you keep all of those from just cooking that car? Are you, are you sitting on your laptop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even want to think about sitting um, on a half a ton of, of laptop batteries. Um, yeah. Um, well, look, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, we do extensive safety testing. Um, I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. This is a serious subject. Um, the, uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll break it down. Okay. So we start off at the cell level. Um, we use only the finest cells. Um, uh <laughs> Corinthian. Corinthian finest, cells. Finest cells. <laughs> Each one gently observed uh, and, and carefully prepared. Um, we, we, use, we, so we, we do actually use highest quality cells, which, which come from Japan. Um, they're, um, they're, they're, they're carefully verified by the manufacturer. Then when we receive them, we, we uh, check each cell. Um, we, uh, in addition to the fuse that's, for, that's built into the cell from the manufacturer, we, we double fuse the cell. So it's triple fused in total at the cell level. Um, then the cells are incorporated into modules. The, the modules um, are designed to ensure that there's passive propagation resistance between the cells. So that, what that means is um, even if uh, all active safety systems fail and a cell goes into what's called thermal, thermal runaway, it, it, that energy is contained um, and it does not uh, spread to any neighboring cells. 
Um, okay. So this involves in insulating the cells, making sure you've got a, th a thermal con a conduction path to get rid of the heat, so, it, it, you, so you don't um, essentially have a chain reaction. Um, so then that, that's quite tricky. Um, and, and then, uh, but, but we obviously never want to get to that, to, to, to even losing a single cell. Right. So we, we have an active cooling system, uh, which is, so the battery pack is liquid cooled. Um, and and that, that also is a tricky problem because you need to be thermally conductive but electrically isolated. Um, and moreover, you need, that needs to be true over a hundred thousand plus miles right. of bumpy, bumpy the roads. The great problem and in real life cars. Yeah, real life cars. Real life cars are. It, it is a hard. It is hard to make things last for a hundred thousand miles and you know, right. ten years and that kind of thing. So, you, you, if you hit potholes and you get, so you got, you know, it's getting shock, uh, you know, road, shocks from the road. Uh, it's getting vibrations going through extremes of temperature. Um, it gets into an accident. Under all these circumstances, you cannot have uh, the pack uh, catch on fire. Right. Um, very hard problem, and and then it also it, it it must be you you must be able to make the pack inexpensively. Uh, it's got to be pass all the regulatory uh, requirements. Um, you've got to uh, preserve the pack uh, so that you maximize the calendar and cycle life of, of the the chemistry within the cells. Um, charging. So you have to deal with the DOT and the DOE. Yeah, Any branch of a lot of departments. You, yeah. Um, Tell me more. Uh, I don't want to go into too much minutiae. Tell me more about the car. Yeah, what sorry. I, you know, like? I, I, what's, what's I should have like said. I should have. I should have. Yeah. I'll give you the sales pitch on the Model S. Okay. So, um, this is a car that has a range of up to 300 miles. Um, it, it seats uh, up to seven people. That's five adults plus two kids. And the, the way we get the two kids is uh, it's kind of like the old station wagons. We have two rear-facing kid seats in the back. Um, that's an option that you, can, that, that you can order. I remember those days. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's not great being in the back, <laughs> being in the back, but it, I guess it could be kind of fun if you're a kid and you can sort of watch all the other cars and stuff. Um, and, and most people, you know, when you, when you put seven people in a, in a car, it's almost never seven adults. And it's only occasionally, right. rarely is it seven people. Um, so we try to make something that could substitute for your SUV. Uh, so you don't have to have caught this gigantic seven-passenger SUV all over the place. It will be five-star crash rated, and, and that, that's a very hard thing to achieve. In fact, today's five-star will, will, re, will reduce to a, a three-star in two years. Right, they keep moving the bar. Yeah, they keep, they, they, they keep raising the bar on, on, on to what's necessary to achieve a five-star. So people might think, oh, I've got a five-star today. It'll be like a five-star in two years. No, it, that's like a three-star in two years. I mean, you basically have to be you know, a Sherman tank uh, right. level safety to get to five stars. We will be at five stars. I'll have my own kids in the car. We're not going to make something as, as less than five stars. you've got a of kids, too. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be fully occupied in the car. Um, and, um, and, and so the, the, the challenge then is to make it, make it super safe, but not super heavy. Um, so it's, it is quite a difficult mechanical engineering problem and mass optimization problem. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, arguably, it will be safer than, than an SUV because it will have such a low center of gravity uh, because the battery pack is in the flow pan. Um, that you're not going to have the tip over risk. It's going to stay on the ground. Yeah. So, I mean, if, you, cause if you're going on like some mountain path or something and you go off the side, I mean, it doesn't matter how many airbags you got, you know, right. um, you, you're, you're toast. So, you want to make sure you don't have tip over risk. And then that, that sort of, on, on tip over risk, you'd actually win against an SUV. Um, and, uh, Tell me a little about the ergonomics. I hear you have some innovations on the dashboard. Absolutely. And that sort of thing. So, for, for the interior uh, approach, um, you can think of it like, like a giant iPhone. Okay, that's the center console. So imagine a 17-inch diameter iPhone, um, and that, that's the, the basic thought there. And, and 3G wireless connected. Uh, really? So, yeah, absolutely. In fact, so it'll have your controls, your, your standard controls for uh, stereo, HVAC, but it's also going to be able to do uh, connect to the internet. So you want to do Pandora radio, if you want to do YouTube, what, whatever you want to do. Um, it'll have a browser. Uh, so it's just Linux, Linux running a, running uh, running a browser. Um, so if you want to look at your your email not, while you're not driving. Um, and uh, in fact, there's some sort of interesting ideas. People thought of, well, like maybe you, you could have it uh, read out your email to you while you're driving, right. um, and um, you know, do voice commands on on, on the computer. And so, and, and we, it's nice to allow people to develop applications uh, that that could run on on the, on the computer because it's a full-fledged computer. It's not some sort of dumbed-down car car thing. Um, and um, and also, you should be able to theme. The, the display. So, so there's a 17-inch display in, in front, and there's about an 11-inch display in front of you. So it's, it's user-modified display. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a read-only display right in front of you, and then a, a big 17-inch touchscreen on, on, in the center console. 
And uh, you know, you can theme your cell phone, you know, and and customize it to your interests and and, uh, and needs. Well, why can't you do that with a, with a car? You should be able, to, you know, right. seems like a reasonable thing. Uh, so if you want to see different instruments on the front, like you you care about seeing this readout, that readout. Um, you want it to sort of look, have a heavy metal look. You want it, to, you know, want it to look like country and western, whatever. You know, make it more feel like it's more your car, not just something that rolled off an assembly line. So you could have the dashboard of a '67 GTO. Yeah, Stuart absolutely. Stuart Warner gauges yeah. if you wanted to. You can, can have it look like steam gauges if you wanted. Yeah, to. yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Uh, um, so this is your this is your five series killer. You know, we're not going to kill. At, at, we're, we're twenty. We're looking at twenty thousand units a year, so we're not going to kill anything. Right. At, and. and uh, We'll, we'll impinge on the market share on a, of several cars out there, like Lexus, Mercedes, Mercedes BMW, uh, you know, Audi, um, Infiniti. But, but really, it'll be a small, I mean, a hardly noticeable impact on, on total sales. I mean, you know, this, well, at least there were 17 million, dollars, 17 million cars sold in the U.S. a year. I think it's down about, you know, <laughs> not much, <laughs> like right. nine, 9 million cars a year at current run rate. So. Uh, if we're, even at, even at nine, even at my nine million cost a year, yeah, yeah, and at that twenty thousand is ten thousand domestic, ten thousand international. So we're we're talking, you know, point oh one percent of the car market. Okay, so give me some performance point, specs. Point give me yeah. some performance specs on this thing. Price, starting price forty nine thousand nine hundred. Forty nine thousand. Nine hundred. Um, well, yeah. Okay. And. <laughs> uh, Gosh, that's less than fifty. <laughs> yes, that's right. It is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Only fifty grand. That, that's half the price. It is. It is half the price. The for. That's, yes, that's uh, quite impressive. Thanks. And now that is after there's a seventy-five hundred dollar. Remember that federal right, tax rebate? rebate? That's after the seventy-five hundred dollar. Although I haven't taken into account the gas guzzler tax. So in effect, for an apples to apples comparison, it would be a little bit less than that. Maybe forty-seven thousand or something like that. And you said distance was on a charge. It, um, it can go up to three hundred miles. But now the the the, the forty-nine thousand nine hundred one will do. 160 miles, okay. um, it's, but the, there will be a 300 mile range pack available. Um, and uh, one of the things we're thinking of doing is, is perhaps making that something you can rent. So if you can, if you can't afford the more expensive 300 mile range pack or don't want it, then that's fine. Get the 160 mile pack, rent the bigger one when you, when you need it. Some other ways we've addressed the range issue is a 45 minute fast charge capability, which is about the limit of the battery chemistry. Um, and then uh, we're designing the battery pack such that it can be switched out faster than you can fill a gas tank. Um, which, in principle, if you think about it, I mean, the, the, it, this is this is basically a big laptop on wheels. Right. Um, and if you can switch out your your laptop battery, you know, in 30 seconds, well, why can't you do that with a big one? You just need something that can simulate a hand well, at a large that, scale. Because we hit those two little clips, and that 500-pound battery pack falls out. <laughs> yes, you know, not something you can do by hand. Right. But you, so you need you do need special equipment at a, sort of a battery pack swap station. Um, uh, and there's you know, companies out there that are looking to, 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 to do swap stations. Now, weren't you talking about when it, your, your solar company? Weren't you talking about having solar panels that people could put on like the roof of their house? Yeah, And absolutely. do home charging for a quick 75 miles or whatever it was? Well, um, the, the, the most efficient thing to do is to actually put solar panels on, on the roof of your house and, uh, and just have them char basically power your house, uh, particularly during the day, because during the day is when you, you encounter peak load. Right. Uh, and they have to put the least efficient power stations online uh, at, dur during the day, um, and uh, and then at night. That it, it, at night, it's actually better to charge your car at night. Um, so it's better to like decouple it effectively. Okay. So if you want to if you want to be um, truly green, then you just need to say, okay, well, I'm going to generate more uh, energy via solar than I consume in my car. Um, Although the Model S will have a solar, a, a solar panel option, so you can put solar panels on the on the roof of the car itself. On the car itself, okay. Um, yeah, and and there's some interesting ideas to potentially have uh, solar solar carports, um, and um, if you want to get some some really sort of crazier ideas, are to like try to coat the whole car uh, w with uh, uh, some sort of amorphous uh, uh, photovoltaic uh, coating, and and you know have the whole thing be, be one big solar panel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now there was talk for a while. And I guess you've abandoned it, even putting a gasoline engine in. Yes. Uh, is, that, is that gone? It is gone. We looked closely at the whole plug-in hybrid thing. And um, you know, so, it, uh, I guess about a, a week ago or so, there was a guy who, who um, asked me some, asked me, sent me an email. He's like, he, he, he runs like a Volt site or GM Volt site or something. 
he's not, he's not, he's not working for GM, but um, he just said, you know, so why, didn't, why isn't Tesla doing, doing the range extended electric vehicle approach, the plug-in hybrid thing? Um, and I, I just sort of gave him a kind of a matter of fact, this is why we chose the strategy of one another. And then, you know, it's all over the place, like, I'm trashing the vault. I'm not trashing the vault. <laughs> I hope the vault is successful. Um, and I've said so many times. Um, but I to, I'm just explaining why, why did we not do that. So I'll explain here. I mean, basically, um, uh, what it comes down to is uh, it's a technical point. Because um, we had to sort of drill into it to quite deeply to appreciate why, why it wouldn't be ideal, in our opinion, to have a, a plug-in hybrid. If, if you go from, say, if you consider a 200-mile range pack uh, versus, say, um, a 40-mile range pack. It sounds like you've got, you, you, you have a pack that is one-fifth the size, right, for the 40-mile 40, 40 pack. But that's actually not true. So, because what happens is the 40-mile the pack has to generate, particularly if it's a range-extended electric, so you're not, you know, it's, it's a, the 40-mile pack has to generate five times the power. Right. Um, although technically you could have the, the, the motor running and so it might, maybe it only has to generate two and a half times the power but then you're, you're running both simultaneously, and that, you're not really being electric if, you, right. if you're doing that. So if you just consider the pure electric case, you've got to generate five times the power. But the way it works in battery chemistry is that power and energy work, work, at, uh, work at opposites. You can either have a high power pack or a high energy pack. Energy is total mileage. Power is the rate at which you can take, uh, ener you know, the rate at which you can consu consume that energy. Right. Um, and uh, so in effect, you then push to a low energy density chemistry in a plug-in hybrid case. Um, and because you're hitting the pack so hard, you, so it's, doing, it's, it's working so much harder than the bigger, the, the bigger pack um, that you have to derate the pack, derate the energy content. So, in, in, so you end up with something which is close to half the size, maybe, eight, maybe 40, 40 to 50 percent of the size of the 200-mile pack. So, so, you ha so uh, and then you've got to add in the cost, the cost and weight of the, uh, the engine, the generator, all the cross connects between the two. Uh, you've got to factor in the, 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 that there's servicing of two complete drivetrains. You still have to deal with all the EPA stuff uh, for, for emissions. Um, and, and then when, you're, when you've consumed your 40 miles, um, which we'll do reasonably free, not every day, but maybe every, every may call it every third day. Um, you, you, you're then going to have something which is mass, an, en an engine which is super, really underpowered. Right. Um, it's it's going to push this heavy car down. Yeah, it's going to like it's going to feel like I've got a lawnmower engine trying to power my sedan, um, and it's it, so it's going to be running at very high RPM. It's going to be working really, really hard. Um, it's not going to make that hundred thousand miles. It's going to be tough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so you really it's going to feel very anemic um, on, on the on the highway and. Uh, uh, so it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's problematic. Um, you're neither fish nor fowl. And it stands to reason that if you've got a given mass and cost, and you say to an engineer, make the best electric car for, for a fixed mass and cost, or you say to an engineer, make the best gasoline car for fixed mass and cost, it's going to be a better gasoline car or a better electric car than if you split the baby. So you're not trashing hybrids, but you just did a pretty good job of trashing hybrids. <laughs> Well, I, I could be wrong, you know. Um, I'm just saying that's the reasoning that, that caused us to, right. to focus uh, on, on electrics and continue to focus on electrics. Um, Let me ask you a Silicon Valley question. Yeah. Uh, your vice chairman, and for a long time the CEO of the firm, is a name out of Silic the Silicon Valley past, Zev Drury, a guy right. that we haven't seen around here for 30 years who ran monolithic memories right. way back when. Uh, kind of a legendary figure, kind of a swashbuckling guy. Uh, I seem to remember he ran, he was running monolithic memories and the Yom Kippur War broke out and he literally called into the office and said, I'll be in Israel until the war is over and volunteered and went off to battle. Uh, unique guy, but he's been missing from action right here for a long, long time. Where did you find him and why would you get a chip guy? In a battery business, in a car business. Sure. Um, how do we find him? Um, actually, it was, it was through one of the investors um, at, at Tesla. It, it, it went, Zev is a, is a car guy. I mean, he, was, he went into sort of racing, did a lot of racing. Um, and um, it was a very, very competitive 
you know, obviously, you know, great entrepreneur, strong track record, um, and I think very importantly, he was someone who was he was not afraid of of danger, <laughs> as evidenced by his running off to the Yom Kippur War, uh, Yom Kippur, Kippur War. Um, so, uh, you know, towards the end of 2007, uh, we needed to find a CEO for, for, for Tesla, and we didn't have a lot of takers. Um, because it was a t it was a very difficult situation, um, and there weren't there weren't very many people with the the, the guts of, of Zev, um, and uh, anyway, so so you know Zev Zev I thought was somebody who who, who could help get us out of a pickle, and uh, and who wasn't afraid to try to do that, um, and I mean I, I, it's hard to describe. Tesla was in a really dire situation at, at the end of 2007. Um, it, it had come to light that uh, the car's cost was $140,000. We'd been selling it for $92,000. Um, You're going to make it up in volume. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and not only that, we, we couldn't, I mean, there were several bro things broken about the car technically. Uh, transmission being the most notable item, but there were a lot of other issues, um, and uh, you know, so so we it really wasn't a car that could even 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 if we said okay, we'll we'll we'll, we'll accept the forty hundred forty thousand dollars. This isn't a car that would have passed safety and, and reliability and endurance tests, um, and so it was just wow. And, and we were sort of out of money, or well, close to being out of money. Um, so this is a, you know. Yeah, like 18 months ago. Um, you know, in your situation like that, you've got to be pretty bold if you want to come in and run, you know, help, help run the company. So, uh, and he, he was willing to do that, and, and he'd, he'd sort of, like I said, he'd, he'd taken, taken things from very tough situations uh, before, and so he, yeah, he joined as, as CEO. And I, I, in effect, he and I were kind of the co-CEOs of the company um, because he, he was coming in cold and didn't know any of the, any of the background. Um, and although I'd, I'd been at sort of a fairly high level up to that point, um, and not in the nitty gritty, uh, at least I had the, co the contextual background. So he and I basically ran the company together for about 18 months. Um, and then when the financial crisis hit, uh, I guess it was about, well, I mean, the financial crisis hit, and I was like, oh man, okay. So I, I got to up my time in, in the company and, and, and go from being kind of the, the half CEO to the full CEO, um, because I also had to up, up the ante in terms of my, my investment in the company financially. Um, so it's like, all right, if I'm going to do that, then I, I, I got to, um, you know, be the full, the full CEO, not the half CEO. Well, now, Bold is, you know, the ultimate entrepreneurial trait, and you obviously have it. I, I want to go back. Let's talk about your upbringing. But before we do that, real quick, uh, f 40, how much for the, for the S? 49, 49,900. 49, 49, okay, yeah. how fast? Uh, it's, it's zero to sixty in about five and a half seconds, and uh, top speed uh, one hundred and thirty miles per hour, electronically limited. We will have sport versions of the S that will go have a zero to sixty of under five seconds. Um, so, but five five and a half seconds in a sedan is plenty far, oh, plenty yeah. fast. Oh yeah, uh, so. I'm thinking about those kids in the back seat facing backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not three point nine seconds like the Roadster, but it's pretty fast. So. Yeah, real fast. All right, let's talk about your upbringing. You leave home at seventeen. And you want to get to the States, right? Was that your dream? Yeah. First of yeah. all, you don't want to be in the Army. That didn't seem like a good use of time, being in the, yeah. <laughs> being, <laughs> serving in the, as a, yeah, being conscripted in the South African Army just didn't seem like a great way to spend time. So without your parents' approval, you take off and you end up in Canada first? Well, so I was trying to figure out how to get to the U.S. to so try to convince my parents to move there. Oh, my parents were divorced, so at least one of them could move there and I could move there with them. Um, and uh, but I, I wasn't successful in convincing them. And um, but but then I, f I found out my mother had been born in Canada, so I kind of walked her through the process of getting a Canadian, her, getting her Canadian citizenship, which allowed me to get my Canadian citizenship, which meant I could go to Canada. Um, and my my grandfather was American actually, or, uh, but but because my mother hadn't gotten her American citizenship before he died and before certain age restrictions, I wasn't able to get American citizenship unfortunately directly. Um, so I went to Canada initially. Canada's a great country. Uh, I was there for, for about three years. And um, 
and then uh, came down to, to the States to, go to, to continue going to school at, at UPenn uh, with Wharton. And you live on a book a day. How did you, well, how do you live on a, Yeah, but how do you yeah. do that? I mean, there's several times in your life when well, you're basically <laughs> well below the poverty line, right? And this is yeah. one of them. But, oh, book a day, was, that was 20 years ago. Yeah, so, so it was that's like two bu bucks a day. Two bucks a day. Well, there's uh, there's all the difference. <laughs> it is uh, all the, it does make a big difference. Um, yeah, well, I, I wasn't quite sure how much money, you know, uh, how uh, how hard it would be to get a job or, or anything like that. So I, I hadn't really had a, a real job because um, I was only seventeen. So I'd done like paper routes and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I thought, well, just in case. Uh, it takes me a long time to get a job. I, I better make sure that my tiny stash of money uh, lasts a long time. So uh, I, had, I only had a few thousand dollars. Uh, so, um, so I thought, well, wait, let me see if I can live for under a buck a day. And you can do it. I mean, you just buy like hot dogs in bulk and oranges in bulk and you know, sc scurvy is bad. So you could have an orange, throw an orange in there. Yeah, so um, when the blisters start forming on your tongue, it's time right. to get an orange. You know, an orange every couple of days will, will you know, keep scurvy away. Um, and uh, hot dogs are, you know, like it, it's just sort of like pasta and pasta sauce. You know, just buy the stuff in bulk and, and uh, you can get, at least at the time, you can get to under a buck a day. So now you pick up two to get a little, get a little monotonous after a while. But, yeah, I can imagine the yeah. 14th day in a row of spaghetti. <laughs> right. Uh, a lot of people pick up econ degrees, a lot of people pick up physics degrees, but not many people pick up both of those. Those are yeah. two different worlds. I thought it was relatively unique, and then I found it actually somebody else did it. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I was, it was, um, yeah, just, I, I, uh, um, I mean, I'm more an engineer than anything else. You know, uh, engineering and design is my interest. Um, but I figured if I don't learn the business stuff, then somebody else is going to make me do things I don't want to do. Um, so I better learn, you know, the, the secrets of business, uh, and so I, that's why I did the, uh, the physics degree as well as the, the, fi the Wharton finance degree. Now, now this is the most the finance stuff was easy, by the way. That was really easy. like I, I say all of my business courses, like in the final year, all of my business courses together were not as hard as quantum mechanics. Okay, I'll buy yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> So now, this is the mythical moment in your career. You get accepted to grad school at Stanford. That yeah. alone's a pretty big deal. You're in physics. Well, to be precise, um, actually, my initial department was the material science uh, okay. department. Um, and, and you use the word high-energy physics, and, and, and that's actually a defined term in physics. Technically, um, I would have actually been in, in kind of uh, um, the, the quant quantum mechanics more than high energy physics uh, because the area I was going to be researching was a, a sort of an intersection of applied physics and material science um, and basically trying to figure out can you uh, create a, a capacitor um, with, enough, that, uh, with enough energy density to replace a battery. Um, now capacitors are very common components in circuit boards um, and and they are occasionally used to store limited amounts of energy, but the problem is that, they, that the energy density does not compare to, to what a battery can do. But if you, if you could get a capacitor to approach uh, the energy density of a battery, then things like charging could be done in minutes or seconds, technically. Um, so you wouldn't have a recharge time issue. And then also cycle life and calendar life are, are, would be measured in decades. But Elon, uh, you were there yeah. for two days. <laughs> you were there for 48 yeah. hours. I've been in meetings that lasted longer than 48 hours. Right. I've been drunk longer than 48 hours. <laughs> Me too. Two days? <laughs> How do you do two days? I mean, that's not even long enough to like get the books. Well, it was a, it was a tough decision, actually. Um, I was trying to figure out, OK, should I do grad studies or start a company uh, doing some internet stuff? And this was in 95. It was before. Um, before the bubble. Just before. Before Netscape, you weren't public. Yeah. Um, so in fact, w when I started Zip2, it was not with the expectation that I would make a large sum of money. It was like, OK, can I make enough money to live um, and uh, buy food and stuff? That's, that was really the threshold. It was a very, very low threshold. And Netscape had not gone public. Um, Somebody wrote something about me that said, oh, I, I saw Netscape go public, and that's why I decided to start Zip2. I started Zip2 in the summer of 95, um, and uh, before Netscape had gone public. I tried to get a job at Netscape, actually, and, and my, didn't hear back from them. So, now, now, so you're reading your, bi uh, you're reading your biography. I would have thought 
you were the wild man, the black sheep of the family. But now I've come to the conclusion it has to be your brother because you come out planning to get a PhD and 48 hours later, your brother has convinced you to drop out of school and, and join his new company. Not, not quite. No, actually, um, I convinced my brother to come from Canada. Oh. Yeah. Um, but my, my brother is a convincing guy. I, I, maybe it was, uh, well, he was in Canada at the time. Um, right. And, and uh, uh, but I, you know, I always wanted to do something with my brother, and he wanted to do something with me. And, um, and so. A $300 million shared gift is a pretty good gift for you. Yeah, but I, I mean, I really, it, at the time, it was, the expectations were really tiny. Now, is I this mean, when you were sleeping on the floor in your office? Um, actually, I was sleeping on a futon, uh, which turned into a couch during the day. So that was like where you held your meetings. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That were true. So um, you you were you were you had a, you were renting an office, but you didn't have a place to live, right? So the your apartment office... cost more than the office. So we so then my brother and I just got two futons, um, which turned into couches, you know. And then during the day, and then we'd have our meet, we'd have a table and we'd have meetings there, and then at night there'd be unbeknownst to the people that we'd have meetings with, that would be where we slept. Um, and then we shouted at the, the YMCA on Page Mill and El Camino. Uh, so, uh, and then you could work out as well, so I was in great shape. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was actually fine. Um, so all you guys sitting in Pete's with your business plans, you, think, you guys think you have it tough. Uh, any questions from the audience right now? We're going to get into space in a minute here, but I want to, as long as we're on cars, let's take car questions first. Question, yes, sir. Thank you. I'm very interested in your idea about um, email being built into your next car. Now, the question I have for you is, say I'm sending you an email with this voice. Is that what you're going to hear while you're driving? My <laughs> voice reading my email to you, and when you respond to me, I'll hear your voice responding to me. It's just an idea, so you yeah. got it from me. Just keep it in mind. You don't have to respond right now, yes or no. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Everybody sign an NDA on the way in? <laughs> Why did you name the car Tesla? Uh, so, well, the, the, the company's named after Nikola Tesla, um, who's uh, actually very well known in, the, in, in physics uh, because units of magnetism are actually units of Tesla. Um, and, uh, and I mean, he came up with a number of innovations. He also went crazy, but uh, so hopefully that, that's no indication of the future of Tesla. Um, but, but, but I mean, he was a great man and, and, and didn't get, I think the popular. Uh, side of things hasn't gotten quite the recognition that he deserves. Um, so uh, it was a choice between it was gonna be Tesla or maybe My Faraday after Michael Faraday. So um, so uh, capacitance is measured in, in farads, by the way, in farads. So uh, could you give us uh, your perspective on the future of Detroit? Uh, future of Detroit. Wow. Um, well. They're clearly, the companies are going to be smaller than they used to be. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't think I, I can, actually, I'm not sure I could shed any light uh, that, that people don't already know about Detroit and that it's going to be a, a much smaller industry than before. Um, th there's, I think there's a good chance it will emerge uh, healthier from this, this process than, it, than it, it's been in recent years. Um, I mean, GM and Chrysler in particular, and to some degree Ford, this was inevitable. It was only a question of when. Um, and so this, the financial crisis kind of accelerated the inevitable, but it, 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 it didn't. It would have happened anyway. Um, so uh, uh, you know, there, there need to be substantial reforms in the management side and on the labor side. And um, you know, I think really they, they need to get back to, they need to focus on producing great products. Um, that's what it really comes down to. You know, if, if you say, who makes great cars, uh, how many people in this room would say GM? Um, like, it's kind of unusual. Um, people say that. Um, if you said, tell me who makes the best cars in the world, it might be a Toyota or a Daimler or a BMW or an Audi or um, something like that. Uh, so, I mean, that's really what great companies are both in great products. 
<laughs> Hopefully. But now, once you prove mass production of an electric car, why wouldn't the M&A guys from General Motors and Ford come knock on your door? Well, I should I point out that if, if you, there needs to be some currency for that acquisition. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the, the stock isn't worth a lot, and, right. and they don't have any cash. They're not going to give you, you're not going <laughs> to so, take equity in General Motors? <laughs> no, well, no. Um, so, I mean, I, I made this comment actually several months ago. Um, I mean, I was, I was a, little more, a little more flippant when I say, well, what if General Motors calls up and, if Bob, what if Bob Lutz, who's no longer on the board, calls up and says he'd like to acquire Tesla, what would your response be? I say, well, you can't afford it. Because, and that's just true. I, mean, I don't think they can afford much of anything. They just don't have the cash and the equity is not worth anything. One more, one more car question out there, and then we'll one go to space. Uh, yeah. How would you compare a Tesla with Fisker Automotive? Uh, so, well, <sighs> Fisker is producing a plug-in hybrid. Um, uh, so Fisker is producing a, a, a plug-in hybrid. It's not, as we were talking about earlier, it's, we're pursuing a different strategy um, for the reasons I articulated. Um, and um, you know, if Fisker is staying, I think they're, they're producing a four-door sedan, but it's a, it's a sportier uh, sedan than ours. Um, you know, the, our sedan is intended to, to, to really be very functional and um, have a lot of cargo space, carry five adults in comfort, plus potentially two kids, and still have room for luggage. Um, and and we're, we're at sort of the roughly $50,000 price point there, I think at around $80,000 starting price after tax rebates. I think that's probably a fair characterization of the differences. Let's talk about space. We literally don't have enough time interviewing you to cover everything you do. Uh, we could do three different events on three different activities. Well, let's do space real quick. Where does SpaceX stand right now? What's the status of things? And where's the, what's the status of the X Prize too? Let's get into that. Okay. Um, well, SpaceX is doing really well, thankfully. Otherwise, I'd be in real trouble. Um, I mean, it terms of, particularly in terms of the time that it, that it takes, of, 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 you know, the time that I have to dedicate to, to, to the companies. I mean, I'm, I'm, on average, I'm sort of roughly 50-50 between uh, SpaceX and Tesla, uh, although as there are issues that crop up that need to be addressed, that, may, that could swing it to as much as 80% SpaceX or 80% Tesla in a given week. Um, so, but but so, SpaceX um, is profitable. It's been cash flow positive for the pro cash flow positive and profitable for the last two and a half years. Um, uh, got, we got to orbit last year uh, we, in December, just before Christmas. Uh, NASA awarded SpaceX a 1.6 billion dollar contract uh, to um, resupply the space station with cargo. When does uh, that begin? Uh, that, uh, that begins at the end of next year. Okay. So the first mission, first the first operational mission after the demonstration missions is December of next year. And at what point do you take over completely? Don't you have exclusivity for a while as as the space shuttle retires? Well, the space shuttle is supposed to retire at the end of next year. Okay. So then, and then we'd follow uh, cargo missions immediately thereafter. Although, if the space shuttle ends up running a little longer, then there may be some overlap. Okay. Um, Are you going to hit those milestones? I think. That we have a, a decent chance of doing it. It's not entirely. I hope there's going to be guys. You have guys waiting up there for simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, NASA isn't. NASA isn't. I don't think NASA's counting on us being there exactly on time. Uh, they do have some contingencies, um, um, and we're certainly going to do our best to meet those, those timelines. I, I think. I think we can. Uh, we don't have. It's not fully within our power because, you know, there's there's NASA as well. We've got to meet all the NASA uh, safety requirements and. If they levy requirements on us that we don't yet understand or appreciate, or their new requirements, uh, then that could push out the the, the effective date of, of of the first operational mission. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be much much beyond the end of next year. So I'm, I'm curious. I've always wondered about this about you. Did you know? Space exploration rockets are the stuff of governments, large countries. Yeah. Did you have an epiphany one day where you just said, "To hell with it! I'm going to actually do this myself." I'm going, to have, I'm going to create a commercial space company? Yeah. I mean, are, who well, who sort comes of. up with that idea? You know, you, in the shower? It driving, is, it is driving kind of out, the out of left field, yeah. Um, well, like, you know, you mentioned uh, the areas of interest that I had in college. You know, one of them was, was uh, space travel. In, in particular, the extension of life beyond Earth, uh, to, to like making life multiplanetary. 
I mean, now, I, I actually, when I was in college, Elon, I didn't think I would actually be a part of space. I was going to say, you're the only guy who, had, who thought of this stuff that actually did it. I mean, there are millions right. of people that think, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to you know, be an astronaut when I grow up. Not many people actually build rockets yeah. when they're 35 years old. Right, and, and actually, when I was in college, um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't these are the three areas I want to be involved in. It's these are, these are the three areas that I think will most affect the future of humanity. Um, and I didn't, if, if you'd asked me in college, do, I, do you think I'd, I'd be involved in space? The answer would have been uh, almost certainly not. Um, I thought it would be highly unlikely because you need billions of dollars, you know, you need to be a, a government, and actually there's only like a handful of governments that can even do that. Right. So, um, so it wasn't with the expectation that I'd, I'd expect to be involved in space. Um, but but it, uh, as a result of PayPal, the capital I got from that, I could, I could do something in space. And um, it, it actually, uh, the, the, the space stuff, uh, well, it actually came from a conversation at Deo and I, where is Deo? Yeah, <laughs> there he is. So I, we were coming back from a Deo's parents' place in Long Island, and, um, and Deo asked me, like, what am I going to do after PayPal? Um, and I said, well, you know, I, I thought maybe there'd be something philanthropic that could be done in space that would get the public more excited about uh, uh, space travel and, and in particular, uh, sending people to Mars. Um, and I and, uh, said, so, but I'm sure NASA's got that covered. And, uh, you know, so um, I'll, I'll go look on the NASA website for, for when are we going to Mars? Because, of course, it should be on the website. Like, we're going to Mars in this year, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, but there was nothing, n nothing at all. Um, about, about people going to Mars. I was like, this is, I just don't understand why there's nothing about people going to Mars. Um, because if you look at the literature in the 70s, um, it was all about, well, we went to the moon, now we're going to go to Mars. Right. Um, and so what happened? And the, well, there was a space shuttle, and the space shuttle turned out to be a really big mistake. Um, and um, it could barely get to low Earth orbit, um, forget about Mar moon or Mars or anything like that. And uh, so I thought, well, geez, maybe I can do something that's going to, Get the public excited about about Mars, and 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 that will generate con congressional support, which will turn into funding for NASA to to go do this. Um, and uh, looked looked at a few different options. Actually, Adair and I did, did a couple of trips to Russia to look at, at buying some Russian refurbished Russian ICBMs. Right. Um, that's. <laughs> Just change the telemetry a little bit, yeah. Yeah, make sure you, you shift the payload. Like, which, one do, which, which button do we press? <laughs> um, and meanwhile, NASA lost the uh, blueprints for the Saturn V rocket, right? So you couldn't rebuild that. Right. Um, Saturn V was a great rocket. It's, it's just too bad that, that we, we, you know, we should just rebuild that rocket and make it better, like, just improve on that rocket. It was, it was, a, good, it was a good design. Um, it's so, so much better than, than the space shuttle. It's so are you going to put a man on Mars? Comparable. Are you um, going to put a man on Mars? You and I have a bet. I yeah. haven't forgotten the bet. Right. We were in a plane flying over the North Pole under the Aurora Borealis, right. as a matter of fact, and we made a bet. You you believe that man would walk? You would put a man on the moon by twenty? Not on the moon. Oh, I'm sorry, on Mars. Yeah. By twenty. Twenty twenty maybe. I think it was twenty twenty or twenty twenty five. Okay. You going to make it? We'll try. What's the next milestone for SpaceX? Well, um, there's the next big milestone would be launching Falcon 9, our big rocket, which hopefully will occur towards the end, of, you know, around the end of summer. Um, and uh, that's the rocket that'll be used to uh, carry our Dragon spacecraft to orbit, and Dragon spacecraft is what will service the space station. Um, so Falcon 9 is a pretty good sized rocket. That's actually the most powerful single core rocket in the, in the U.S. fleet, um, more powerful than. So what Boeing and Lockheed make um, How much does before cost? considering side boosters. How much each one of these cost? Uh, on a per, per flight of Falcon 9, right. about $40 million. Those are big bets. Yeah, uh, all the, and then if you add a Dragon spacecraft on top of that, it's about the same. And then there's Na various NASA overhead. So you're uh, making a $100 million dollar bet when you yeah, light right. the fuse on that thing. Yeah, uh, well, that, that's a deal in the rocket world, by the way. Um, <laughs> For only a hundred million dollars, um, we will carry some cargo to orbit. Um, so yeah, um, so that, that Falcon, launching Falcon 9 will be the, the next big one. There's a sort of smaller milestone, which is uh, an upcoming Falcon 1 flight, maybe as soon as the end of this month. Uh, that'll deliver our first operational satellite to orbit, uh, which is a, a Malaysian satellite. Um, 
it's intended to do Earth observation, you know, for like natural disasters and stuff like that. And um, yeah, and, and then let's see. Then at the end of this year, hopefully, we'll do our, launch our first Dragon spacecraft from Falcon 9. Um, it won't go to the space station. We'll do sort of basic orbital maneuvering and reentry, uh, and then uh, next year we go to the space station for the first time. Okay. How long is the contract for the space station? How, how long? How large? Yeah. How long? How long? Um, it runs through uh, approximately 2015. Okay. And uh, although it, I think it'll be extended beyond that because it, right. um, it's just that the operational plan for the space station kind of only goes to 2015. So, uh, um, frankly, in, in theory, if you get this right, do we need NASA anymore? Well, absolutely. Um, well, NASA, um, we aren't a customer to NASA. Right. Uh, rather, right. NASA is our customer, I should right. say. Um, so and they're our, big, our biggest customer. Um, and, and in fact, um, when, when NASA does developments, although in, in, in all circumstances prior to this, NASA has, been, has had these sort of made the design decisions, the implementation of those design decisions has been done by um, aerospace contractors. Right. Um, so. Uh, so the, the, the novel thing here is that for the first time, NASA isn't, isn't dictating the design. They're simply saying, we need cargo delivered, we're willing to pay. Giving you a, perf a performance contract and letting yeah, you do the rest. Right, yeah, right, right. It's sort of more like FedEx, you know. Like yeah. <laughs> <or> SpaceX. <laughs> we deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Any questions about space, guys? Got one down here. We have a Homestead High School junior asking a question. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for your uh, Falcon series, you decided to use the Merlin engine, right? Um, right. We, we developed the Merlin engine, actually. Yeah, yes. Yeah. My, my question for you is, why did you go for the single or one type of engine and then use nine of them on the Falcon 9? How many is yep. it? Because uh, I've seen a lot of other, in the history of space, it's like everyone, you know, like above five, you're like, Oh my God! The turbo pumps are all going to blow up or something, and then, so why did you choose that instead of developing a larger engine? Well, I should point out, you know, like the Saturn V, um, although it had five engines on the first stage, also had five engines on the second stage, and then one engine on the third stage. So it was actually an eleven-engine rocket. Um, Falcon Nine has got nine engines on the first stage, one on the second stage. So it's actually one to total of ten, so one less than a Saturn V. Um, and the, the the advantage of the nine engines is that you can lose an engine at any point, including immediately after liftoff, and still complete your mission, which was not true of the Saturn V. The thrust away of the Saturn V was about 1.15, so you actually had a very dangerous point immediately after liftoff uh, where you could potentially subside uh, if, if you had an engine failure within the first few seconds. Um, with, with, uh, with rockets, because you're taking it vertically, um, you, it actually for, for the first stage, it actually, for, you know, the, the initial boost stage uh, points you towards having more engines um, because if, if you want true engine out uh, capability, um, because you always have to have a thrust weight greater than one, otherwise you're coming back. Um, whereas an aircraft, you you can ha have a, a thrust weight of much less than one and still be okay because you, you you can sort of glide and reduce your your climb rate and, and that kind of thing and still be okay. So. So it actually it does it does push you to have more than than say like you know 747's got four engines but uh, it, the, the equivalent for a rocket would be some number greater than four and so and maybe it's not as high as nine but we kind of we needed nine to achieve the pay, the payload requirements that, that our customers wanted um, and and as long as you're very careful about ensuring that the problem with one engine cannot cascade into problems with another engine more is actually better. Um, and uh, you know, G Google operates with tens of thousands of computers rather than a few giant mainframes. Um, so it also fits with the Tesla model of having right. you know, eight thousand <laughs> little batteries. You think nine engines is bad? Uh, <laughs> try six thousand eight hundred thirty-one cells. Next question. So uh, Elon, with the Dragon spaceship uh, spacecraft, is that going to also be a man's craft? And if so, are you going to be shuttling the astronauts back and forth to the space station? Uh, it, yeah, Dragon is designed to meet the NASA man rating requirements. Um, there's a few key documents there regarding uh, structural safety margins and redundancy. It's designed to meet those those requirements. Um, there's uh, um, you know G loading, max G loading, and dealing with worst case abort conditions and that kind of thing. And so it's, it, all those things were, were were designed to meet. 
there's one key development item that we need to finish, which is the escape tower. So that um, we have a launch escape system um, in, in case something goes wrong with the core booster, it can take it can carry the, the, the capsule to safety. Um, it's also something they had during the Apollo era, but didn't have that they don't have that for this this the space shuttle. Um, and if so, the, I mean, and the, really the two uh, weak areas of the space shuttle, and the, and the two most dangerous uh, periods for uh, you know a, a manned vehicle are during this, of the, the ascent phase and the, the descent phase. There are two, there, there, are, there are fundamental architectural flaws with, with the shuttle approach. Um, one is on the ascent phase, there is no escape system. They decided they didn't need an escape system because the shuttle would, would, never, would never fail. Um, really? <laughs> we're like, wow, OK. Um, so, uh, so there's no escape system. If anything goes wrong on the ascent, it's curtains. Um, and then uh, on, on reentry, particularly the initial part of reentry, which is the high heating uh, point, um, the, uh, b because it's, a, it's, really, it's not a naturally stable vehicle, you've got to have control surfaces and wings. Um, you know, or, or, so it has, or it has control surfaces and wings. So if anything happens with the control system, so any, any you know, the electronics that don't work or malfunction or, or there's a hinge that, that you know, isn't working properly in one of the control surfaces, that, that's at your toast. It's not naturally stable. Um, it has to be controlled. And, and then the heating uh, rate goes with the square of the radius of, of whatever you're dealing with. So if you've got a wing leading edge that's got a very, you know, effectively got a sharp radius, you have a very concentrated heat, um, which limits the material choice to some very brittle materials. In fact, um, it, it'll, it'll only work for, for Earth orbit reentry. If, you, if you're coming at a higher velocity than low Earth orbit uh, velocity, there's no material known to man that can withstand it. So actually, if for like the moon, you, you, you couldn't use a winged vehicle. It just, it's impossible. Um, so, um, I mean, it's not like, if you think of Apollo era, Okay, they had airplanes back then. It's not like, oh wow, wings. What are those things? Um, you know, the, the the designers of Apollo, von Braun and, and, and the others, were very familiar with aircraft. Um, if they thought wings made sense, they would have said, let's put wings in this thing. But they don't. Um, when it comes to space, wings are dumb. Just as you don't make an airplane look like a boat. Um, so, uh, so, so, like, it's so, with, it, so if <laughs> when they retire the space shuttle. How are they going to bring the astronauts back until you are, and, and get them up until you're able to do that? The Soyuz. Okay, the Russians will do. It. Yeah, so the Soyuz is a good. I mean, if I, I would definitely prefer to ride, ride on the Soyuz than the space shuttle. Um, you, you have an escape system on the Soyuz. Oh, and then of course it, it, on reentry, um, a capsule, a blunt body reentry capsule, you, can be designed to be naturally stable, so that even if all the control systems fail, that it you know you're just lights out, dark, everything's you know. You, you're, it's, it's naturally, it's like a shuttlecock. It's naturally stable on, on reentry. Um, and you don't have to, you know, um, do anything there. And you can just manually pull the chutes or something like that. So, in fact, that's happened on a couple of Soyuz flights where they've had control system failures. If that had been the shuttle, it would have been curtains. Um, but because it's, the, because it's naturally stable, you don't have to worry about that. And then because you've got that blunt body reentry, um, the heat shield is much more robust. Because uh, you've got this really big radius heat shield instead of these sharp radius wings, um, so it's really a much safer design. Um, and uh, I believe there's never been a, a fatality on the Soyuz, which has been going much longer than the than the, the shuttle. Made many many more flights. So, Elon, yeah. how do you keep these two different things separate <laughs> in your mind? I mean, you're dealing with two massive industries, very distinct worlds. I mean, do you, do you have to like literally say, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing rockets right now. No, I'm doing cars right now. <clears throat> and how do you, man, how do you seg segregate those two things? Because they're, they're both competing for your attention 24 hours a day. Right. And I have kid, my kids actually spend a lot of time with my kids, and by the way. four kids. Five kids, yeah. Five kids. <laughs> yeah. Right. How do you manage um, that? Yeah, that is tricky. Uh, yeah, so. okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, actually, it, it's okay most of the time. But you know, if, if it's when when a, when a crisis flares up in, in either kids or one of the businesses, then it, then it gets it can be quite a little bit overwhelming. So it's like triage all the time. It is. It is kind of like triage. 
Um, I mean, and I, I mean, the, the rocket business and the car business are pretty hard in the best of times, and these are not the best of times. Next question. You don't like wings. I don't like wings for things that go to space where there is no air. I think, I mean, my understanding of the reason the wings were on the space shuttle was so they could land where they wanted to. Oh, okay. So, well, so let, let me let me correct a misconception then. Uh, a, a a blunt body, sort of a capsule, you know, gumdrop style thing, uh, is a controlled uh, landing. Um, in fact, uh, because you have you still have a lift vector, so you you use offset center of mass to to create a sort of a tilt in in the in the capsule, and that actually creates a lift vector. Um, and that lift vector, you typically be but a lift of a drag of 0.2 to 0.3, but that's plenty, plenty enough to, to steer you where you want to go. And in fact, even in Apollo, when they didn't have GPS um, and they, uh, you know, they were really dealing with fairly, very primitive electronics, the, their landing accuracy was a one mile radius. And of course, if you can get much better than that with GPS and all that other stuff. In fact, the only error is uh, the wind drift. Um, that's the only. That's really the only meaningful error. And if you um, if you have if you do a steerable shoots, um, uh, or put some like little like a little propeller that popped out or something like that, um, you could you could drop the capsule on the numbers on the runway, uh, just like you could drop just like a parachutist can can steer their their flight down to a very accurate uh, location. Um, and then you, could, you know, sort of, I think you just sort of like flare it uh, just before you go to the bottom, just like a parachutist, and there you are. Next question in the back. I was there. Uh, I was there several years ago uh, in the Moh Mojave Desert when Space Flight One took off for the maiden voyage. I was wondering, first of all, what was SpaceX's uh, involvement in that program, and do you guys have any plans for taking up civilians into space? Um. We didn't have any involvement uh, with with the um, Bert Rattan Spaceship One, um, except that I'm on, I'm a trustee of the X Prize Foundation, and I I provided a little bit of the funding to um, to, to that to, to the Ansari X Prize that they won, um, and I was there for um, one of the flights. Um, so, uh, and it's actually you know it's it's great that it was won. Um, it, but it is worth pointing out that there's a significant difference between a suborbital flight and an orbital flight because space kind of seems like, well, space is all the same thing. But if you, if you look at the, the energy required to get to space versus the energy required to get to orbit, it's, they're very different orders of magnitude. Um, you need an ideal velocity of roughly Mach 25 to get to orbit, Mach 3 to get to space, if you define space as, say, um, 50 miles up. Um, and uh, so you, it's pretty, that's a pretty big differential, but, but it's bigger than that because the kinetic energy goes with the square of the velocity. So you need 625 units of energy to get to orbit, 90 units of energy to get to space. Um, so you, about 1.5% of the energy, um, one versus the other. So the requirements are really way, way different. Um, the, uh, yeah, so you need... In fact, it's only just barely possible to escape the Earth's gravity well, just just barely. Um, if you look at the size of Saturn V, uh, for example, that, that and that ultimately took two people to the surface of the moon, one plus one who was orbiting the moon. Um, that was a really gigantic vehicle. I mean, it's like the size of an office building, and it got two people to the surface of the moon. Next question. Um, why do you think uh, multiplanetary existence is important? Uh, uh, excellent question. Um, so, okay, so you have to say, well, how do you decide that anything is important? Um, so there's, um, the, uh, I think the lens of history is a helpful way to dis distinguish more from less important things. And the further out you, you, you zoom, um, the uh, more you can distinguish the less important from the more important. And if you take a look at the whole four billion year history of Earth and the evolution of life itself and say, well, what are the, what are the really big uh, milestones in the evolution of life itself? And you can point to, obviously, you know, single-celled life and multicellular life differentiation into plants and animals, uh, movement of life from the oceans to land, um, 
the uh, mammals, consciousness, you know, sort of those are the big, the biggies. Um, and, uh, and, and those stand above the, I think, the parochial things, uh, concerns of, of, of humanity. Um, and, but I think on that scale would also fit life becoming multiplanetary. I think it would be at least comparable to life going from the oceans to land, arguably more so, uh, because at least oceans to land could be a gradual affair. Um, you know, if it got uncomfortable, you hop back in the ocean. Um, it's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a lot harder to go over, you know, to travel a billion miles over, you know, irradiated space um, and then land in a hostile environment and create a self-sustaining and growing, um, uh, you know, life, ecology. Um, that's really, really hard. And in fact, this is the first time in the four billion year history of life itself that it is even within the realm of possibility. So, so I think therefore, if something is important to be, if important enough to figure on the, the scale of the evolution of life itself, it should be at least considered, say, worth as about as much money as we spend on a lipstick. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe not as much money as we spend on healthcare, but that's a lot. Um, but, but enough, on, you know, maybe north of cosmetics or something. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, I think we should spend a little bit of, of our resources doing that, and and that's just a a wise bet for life as we know it. Um, and um, yeah, so it just and it just seems like that 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 should make it important enough to, for for a little bit of a little bit of money, like maybe a half percent, half a percent of our GDP or something like that, um, and and that'll be enough to do it. Anything you want to say on Solar City? Uh, Solar City is doing great. Uh, thank goodness uh, it is. Tell, you tell the audience oh, what it is. Sure. Uh, Solar City is the country's largest provider of uh, solar power systems to homes and small businesses. Um, so outside of the utility scale solar uh, activity, um, and it uh, it was co-founded and run by uh, Peter and Lyndon Rive, uh, who are my cousins. And interested full disclosure. Um, so I, I serve as the chairman there, and I provide some advice strategically and on the product side. And, um, but thankfully, it requires almost none of my effort. And those guys are just <coughs> awesome in terms of their execution of SolarCity, um, ha having grown it to a leadership position in the course of three years. So um, if anyone's thinking of getting solar, call like 1-800-SOLAR-CITY, <laughs> something like that, or 888, I'm sure. Any uh, questions? Next question. So, here am I. Uh, so, how does that work? I mean, you've you've convinced the NASA to give you like a huge contract. Um, how can I imagine that? What story is behind that? Can you tell us or can you share us that that story a little bit? That's the one question that I have. And the other is, you've been working on solar, you've been working on clean tech, or on cars, you've been working on space. So you're transforming society in all those projects. And then there's PayPal. Um, so how does that fit? That's the two questions. Um, well, definitely, PayPal, I mean, I was completely out of PayPal, well, almost completely out of PayPal when I started SpaceX. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, with, with I mean, I, from, from a business standpoint, my time is really split between SpaceX and Tesla. Almost no time, I spend almost no time on, on Solar City because it's, it's just running so well by itself. Um, and the, the guys there are just doing a great job. And there's really not much I can, I can add to what they're doing. Um, so, um, so, but going to the, the NASA question, it, it took us a long time to, and, and a lot of effort to convince NASA to, to rely on us. Um, and when we, when we won that cargo resupply services contract, um, you know, it's basically value ranging from 1.6 to $3.1 billion, um, we competed against uh, uh, Boeing, Lockheed, and Align Tech Systems. Uh, were actually, they were all three of them together against us. Um, so that, um, there's a sort of a partnership called Planet Space, which is basically, it was just a, it was Boeing, Lockheed, and Line Tech Systems against SpaceX. Um, and we won. So, um, and, or at least NASA felt co confident enough to give us that, that, that deal. So, uh, and and um, preceding that, it had been sort of six years of, of working to gain their confidence. 
um, and we'd won a preceding contract, which was a, called the COTS contract, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, to demonstrate uh, progress in that direction. But I have to give NASA a lot of credit here because without that COTS contract, it would have been very difficult for us to compete for the cargo resupply services contract. They've been helpful in an advisory capacity and, and a financial capacity. So I think uh, we're, we're very grateful to NASA and, and appreciative of everything that they've, they've done because we, we wouldn't be in a position to have won that, that cargo resupply contract without their help. So. During that microsecond each day that you actually have to contemplate other activities, what are you dreaming of now? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I really, um, you know, my mind is full. <laughs> um, just dealing with, with SpaceX and Tesla and, and then Family Matters. Um, but, um, I mean, there are a few areas. Uh, I mean, I have some, this, I, I think at some point in the future, it would be interesting to take a look at, at fusion. Um, that, that's a tough problem. And um, it's something that I think we could solve, but it would, you know, I'd say me. I mean, I think humanity could solve that problem, um, but it is a very tough one. Um, and may maybe there's something I could, where I could be helpful there. Um, and uh, but that's just completely speculative. I'm not, I mean, it could be totally wrong. Success may not be one of the possible outcomes. Hey, if you can get me uh, to sit on 3,000 laptop batteries, you can get me to sit on a fusion reactor. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, fusion, yeah, fusion. There's, some, I think, some scale is needed for fusion, pro probably. Um, although there's some ideas for having smaller scale fusion. Um, I'm not talking about cold fusion, but but sort of I kind of fusion at sort of a nano scale, if you will, like basically very small amounts of fusion in in a little container. Um, but it is a very hard problem. And then um, I have an idea for. Uh, create double-deckering highways, um, which I think I, th I thought a lot about on, when I'm tr driving to work in L.A. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the highways, I mean, it would just be, I think if you create prefabricated sections of highway and did a very efficient kind of a metallic uh, structure that could withstand the worst earthquakes and um, the trick would be making it light and sp very strong and um, and inexpensive, um, but I, I think I know how to do that, um, and it's that sort of a mon relatively mundane, but it would have a big effect on people's lives. Um, and I, I have this uh, sort of idea for an electric plane, which I think could be pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, ele electric supersonic plane. So. That's a lot of batteries. <laughs> it is. A lot, that's a lot of batteries. It is. It is a lot of batteries. Next question. By the way, I haven't heard any of this stuff before. I, this may be in print tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, yes. I, so, so nobody says that's what I'm doing. I, you asked me what I what if in, what in the nano say yes. split second of like I'm like okay. I, I've been thinking a lot about the plane one I, more than I should actually. I try to ban that from my mind. Um, <laughs> I'll talk to you about it. Um, so I, I got to stop myself from thinking about that one because I that that's sort of. That's a very exciting one. Um, I don't think you covered the X Prize, um, the status of the X Prize, and two-part question: What do you think about a bigger X Prize for battery technology in the U.S.? Sorry, a bigger X Prize for what? For battery, oh, battery, battery. battery. Um, yeah, I think an X Prize for battery technology would be great if there's a, you know a sponsor like the federal government or anyone. Um, I, I think it's it's great to incent outcomes rather than that. Um, as you, you know, it's. It's great to make bets, bets on approaches, but it's also good to incent outcomes. Um, and ultimately, you care about the outcome, <coughs> not the approach. And that's the good thing about prizes, is they, they don't try to um, rely on some panel of experts to figure out what the, the, the approach is that's going to work, because often those panels of experts are not the people who are going to figure out the innovations that result in the outcome you want. And that's basically why you have prizes. Um, or, um, so. Uh, I, and as far as the X Prize is concerned, there's um, an automotive X Prize. There's a genomics X Prize uh, for, lo for low cost sequencing of genes. Um, there's the Google Lunar X Prize, um, which SpaceX is trying to help with a little bit by offering. The, the, the only discounted launches we offer are for the Google Lunar X Prize, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's, you know, there's a bunch of stuff happening there. And um, 
I think I think it's a it's a good model. It should be emulated more. Uh, DARPA did a great uh, you know did a great uh, example of, of a prize thing with the DARPA Grand Challenge. Um, that was um, uh, there's the DARPA Grand Challenge, DARPA Urban Challenge for autonomous vehicles. That's got to be one of the highest bang for buck items that DARPA has ever done. Because um, I guarantee, if you made that like a DoD contractor and had like you know Lockheed and Raytheon and all the usual suspects bid on it. It would have been like two billion dollars, and they'd still be working on it. Um, you know, uh, so um, so anyway, I'm, I think there's, there's a lot of room for prizes, and there should be more of them. One more question, then I have one. Given the range of technologies and areas you've touched. I'm curious what your take on robotics is. It almost seems on, on like robotics? It, on robotics, exactly. It seems close enough to what you've done, but I haven't heard you talk about it. Well, um, you know, Tesla does use robotics to a limited extent in um, in its production today, particularly on the battery pack side, because you've got so, so many cells, almost 7,000 cells, that um, some robotic assistance is is important in making the the, the battery pack. Um, and we'll see, certainly see a lot more of that as Tesla scales up. So ro robotics makes makes a, a big, it's, it's great for mass manufacturing. For space exploration, obviously we've seen great dividends paid by robotics as well with the Mars Exploration Rovers. Um, and uh, there's a, a really big rover uh, going called um, Mars Science Laboratory, and that was supposed to launch soon, but it's going to be a couple years uh, before that goes. That's about the size of like a Volkswagen. Um, so, uh, so I, mean, I think there's, there's a, a, a lot of room for robotics in a lot of fields, and um, that'll in increase and continue in both automotive and space and other, other areas. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we still need to make life multiplanetary. It can't just be sort of sending droids out there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pro-life <laughs> uh, in that sense. So, um, so I think robotic exploration, robotic preparation, um, but but uh, but we also need life going beyond Earth as well. So. I was just curious from a perspective of making people's lives better. Yeah. No, I haven't really thought about robotics. Um, personally, um, but, but just not to say that I don't think there are, there, are, there are lots of things that could be automated and where there could be robots that help people in their daily lives. You know, uh, some I'm sure there'll be a continued expansion of the whole iRobot I type type thing beyond vacuum cleaning. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's a great area. So, I have one last question for you. I've followed your career for a long time, known you for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, for many, many years, you were very, you were very successful, but largely anonymous. Yeah, you know, you I... You were a figure for a long time. Right. I was underground. I mean, uh, I mean, you could, you could, I've never seen you walk the street, you, you could walk the streets of Oxford and nobody knew who you were. I saw you I, do I think that. I can still do that, by the way. I don't well, know. but less and less. <laughs> um, in the last couple of years, you've become increasingly a public figure, a celebrity. Yeah. And your name is, starts popping up now in gossip pages and websites and that sort of thing. How yes. are you dealing with that? I don't and is love it. it. <laughs> you know, is, it, is it interfering with your ability to do what you do? Um, it, it, I think I, I, don't like, I don't like it when people think wrong things. I mean, I, I'm like far from flawless. So I'm like, but, but I don't like when people think wrong things about me. Um, and I guess the, the, the um, yeah, I, I, I must say I don't, I don't, I don't really like the, the sort of celebrity element, uh, I, or I, I don't like when people sort of try to write things that are sort of trivialities that don't actually it's like why why I write about that? You know, I, obviously people find that kind of interesting, or some people do. Hopefully, not many. Um, and um, I don't know. Sometimes people say like wrong things that I, I get, you know concerned that well, what if my kids read that? You know, because they're five and they're starting to read. Um, and and that's that, I mean that's probably the most concerning thing. I'm, I'm not too worried about it from a business standpoint because most people that I interact with, uh, particularly if they've known me for a while, 
they know what's true and what's not true, and and um, and in a lot of cases <laughs> they don't care anyway. Even if it was true, they don't care. Um, but but I, I do I do it does concern me if if my kids were to read something that was just not true. Uh, I mean, you understand if, as Tesla continues to be successful, and as SpaceX begins to assume the role of the space shuttle, you begin to become something like Henry Ford and Werner von Braun combined. And that's a level of celebrity few people ever know. And are you ready for that? I'm probably not ready for that. <laughs> I'm not a naturally extroverted person. Um, in fact, I, I, would, I used to be horrendous at public. I mean, I'm not that great as it is, but I used to be really horrendous. Um, and just sort of shake and be unable to speak. Uh, but um, I kind of learned not to do that. Um, so I, I mean, I'd much rather just be you know, doing engineering and stuff. Uh, and design, so that, that's really what I like to do. Um, but, but you know, I mean, I'm happy to, and I, I like doing things like this, which are which are fine. fine and um, but uh, and you you know, if you're in the car business, you got to sell cars and stuff. So I got to I got to go out there and be promotional. Um, but there are other people at Tesla that actually are much better speakers and sellers of the car than, than I am. I think. So. Well, that's hard to believe. Anything else you want to tell these folks out here? Uh, he's talked about a lot. Um, I thought there were some really good questions from the audience, actually. Uh, Put your money down now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, wish, wish, wish us luck. Uh, uh, I don't know, something like that. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not very... <laughs> I'm, I'm not superstitious, but uh, you never know. I mean, there could be some... Uh, divine entity that's sort of uh, if there is uh, then I uh, I hope uh, hope that that entity is favorable <laughs> and if worse comes to worse you already know how to live on a dollar a day yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the uber entrepreneur Elon Musk Thanks. Elon, Mike, thank you so much for being here. We know that you have a very bu busy schedules, both of you. We very much appreciate you taking time to speak with us this evening. And as a very small gesture of thanks, we have a wonderful Churchill Club t-shirt for you. <laughs> Please wear it in very good health. And thank you all for coming. Look forward to seeing you at the next Churchill Club program. And by the way, there are 13 letters in Churchill Club. <laughs> good night.